There's often a saying in trading and investing that markets climb the wall of worry. But in bull markets, they also climb the wall of euphoria. And when Fed speakers tell us directly that rate cuts are coming, markets will rally. So today we're going to discuss these crucial developments and how they affect the macro, the fundamental, as well as the technical sides of the market. Also, we need to talk about gamma, small cap earnings, and of course, sentiment. The weekend poll wrapped up and plenty of you are bullish. So is it time to fade the consensus? We've got a lot to talk about. So let's roll the tape. Welcome everybody to the daily recap show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell. Guys, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. What a day here for the market. We really saw these mega caps do a lot of the heavy lifting here today. Look at Nvidia, Microsoft, Google Meta. I mean, even down half, even up half a percent is just big for the comm sector. It's just big for comm services. Look at Eli Lilly, look at Costco. It really was the big names in each of the sectors that really did a lot of the heavy lifting, but it wasn't just the big names in each sector. I mean, every single sector really did produce gains today. I mean, XLRA was slightly positive, but if you really look at it at a peak to trough basis, it really came alive here towards the end of the day. We're going to talk about why a little later on. We saw GDX, the best performing sector, up 2.36%, then semiconductors and software. I think a lot of software names are sort of running up into their earnings. That's why we saw a lot of upbeat action in software here on Monday. Do you know that earnings this week is largely just a, a hyper growth and software week? And then we had ITB home construction up 1.39%. Any rate cut hopes we get? And this sector really does do really, really well but i mean guys about half the sectors beat the s&p 500 it was a very upbeat day across the broader market i mean when you have you know semiconductors xlc xlf technology discretionary rally you're really going to get peak out performance in the s&p 500 and even look at the stocks that underperform the s&p 500 right so the spy was up one percent for the day but xli up 1.02 percent kre 0.79 xle 0.78 xlb materials up 0.6 you know a very upbeat day across the board and the reason reason why we had such an upbeat day had to do with a bunch of factors. Firstly, Fed Williams, he came out and said the next Fed move will likely be to lower rates. Eventually, there will be rate cuts. That's just so bullish. Eventually, there will be rate cuts keyword will be rate cuts and you know the market's going to take something like this and run with it secondly we had some geopolitical news Hamas on monday said it accepted an egypt qatari ceasefire and also part of the reason why we rallied today was just that it was a continuation from friday and we are in positive gamma and you know you want to be buyers of dips sellers of rips leaning long uh, in a market like this and that's exactly what we saw and let's actually hop on the charts and i'll show you what i mean especially on the five minute chart and look at this green candle here for the s p 500 we pretty much gapped up, opened, rallied, closed at the highs. Nothing more bullish than a candle like that. But before we dive into the actual analysis of the S&P 500, let's go ahead and look at some of the other indices. Now, a couple of things we are seeing is slight, ever so slightly downbeat action here in the after hours. However, really inconsequential. However, today, the S&P 500 up 1%. That's bullish. The NASDAQ up 1.13%. Dow Jones up half a percentage point. Look at the RSP up 0.77%. So this tells us that it was a mega cap led rally. The bigger names put out most of the work. That being said, that was only for the S&P 500. Look at mid caps up 1.4%. S&P 600 IWM, you know, they beat the NASDAQ, beat the large caps. So where large caps did outperform, the S&P broad market did underperform the mega caps, but we saw outperformance in these smaller names. And this tells us that we are starting to see a broadening out and we do have to watch these names looking forward into the next week, into the month of May. And just an all round, very, very solid day here for the S&P 500. You can actually see that bonds did gain on the day as well, TLT up point percent here the agg pretty much flat ever so slightly positive and that's because yields did come down ever so slightly bitcoin actually lost on the day but it did actually it has made quite substantial moves from its lows i mean if we actually just pull up the chart you could see that you know we've bounced off this 56 level so we're just giving a bit of these gains back that we have made here in the last couple of days for bitcoin looking at gold you know it continues to balance at this 2300 2280 level silver however breaking out up three percent here so gold and silver diverging a bit but both were still positive on the day the dollar was pretty much flat not much to say and then oil continues its balancing 
here between 78 and 88 dollars and i still remain convicted that you know pretty much from here to 88 dollars is the range we're going to be in for the rest of the year but let's look at the s p 500 and before we continue with anything something i mentioned on the live streams here yesterday was that we're seeing a huge positive divergence this is the adl line it's the amount of advancing stocks minus the amount of declining stocks divided by the actual s p 500 index right and then you'll actually get a line that moves along with the index and we can see here that this has pretty much remained flat we broke above this high while this has gone down and this is a positive divergence and that is why we're actually seeing upbeat action because you know in the last couple of weeks as the market has moved lower the amount of stocks declining versus the amount of stocks advancing has actually moved up and that's a very very positive and bullish development here for stocks but what we saw on the day today was quite the rally i mean you know we gapped up opened finished at the top and I mean there was just nothing bearish about today at all pretty much from the get-go looking at the five minute chart you can see it right here it was a gap up and we never ever closed below the actual open of the day we did make our way towards it but then we parred a lot of those and we finished making higher highs finishing at the highs of the day pretty much and you could see here that pretty much after some of these fed speakers came in after we got some of the geopolitical news you know the market continued its movement higher towards the end of day and then we also did get a bit of these zero DTEs uh, these hedges rolling off and that did help the market as a whole all in all a very bullish day there's not much that you could really say to fault this market right now I mean we could even see that this was a critical high I had 5170 and I did say in the live stream yesterday that 5200 was our target 5200 is actually the core gamma resistance right now so do expect ourselves to make our way to the 5200 but we should find very very strong resistance at that level leading up into the May OPEX so tomorrow 5200 and then we should find resistance and move lower from there but this is exactly what I said in the weekend video we need to see the s p 500 do and that's make a very early move very early on in the week i particularly said that for the rsp you can actually see we broke above a close above breaking these highs right here which is very very bullish putting in a, a higher high and this is really bullish guys we got you know lower highs higher highs breaking highs and now you know this opens up some of these levels right here and now the next target we can go chase is sort of this 166 here in the rsp we can definitely pull back for sure but do expect us to move higher and you know i, I said it in the live streams like you know the u.s market looks like it wants to go higher that's exactly what we saw today in the s p 500 uh you know here in the nasdaq it was just a gap up go close out the highs that is bullish coupled with the fact that rates are coming down dovish fed speak a geopolitical tension easing and earnings coming in a lot better than expected this is what you're going to get from this market and that's a rally when we had this massive pullback i said to you guys time after time i showed you guys the daily s p 500 earnings scorecard and i said right here the market is still fundamentally sound i said that so many times guys and now we actually have rallied and a lot of people missed the rally a lot of people thought we were going to go lower i just didn't see that my models weren't telling me that and that's why we went higher and that's why i said buy at 5,000 with everything you have at the moment and that has been a very good trade ever since looking at sentiment this is the weekend poll we do these every single week so go ahead subscribe to the channel so you don't miss them very interesting developments stark difference from last week this week for the s p 500 are you bullish bearish or neutral 56 percent of voters chose bullish so very bullish sentiment going into the next week 28 percent of individuals are bearish and 16 percent of you guys are in the neutral camp so so definitely some very very bullish sentiment now guys do take it with a grain of salt that this indicator needs to be used as a contrarian indicator because this was last week's poll i said fomc is next week does pal come out as dovish or hawkish 69 percent of you guys said hawkish and while pal wasn't excessively dovish he did have a dovish tilt to his speech that's part of the reason why the markets rally towards the end of the week the way they did so definitely take this with a grain of salt at the same time 12 of the last 14 polls had you faded them you would have been profitable that week so just some data right there but it's not any data that's worth anything of significance at least from a statistical point you need at least 30 data points for statistical significance now talking about data of statistical significance this is whaley's four quarter breakdown now it's a very very weird breakdown because it goes october 27th to jan 27th jan 27th to april 27th april 27th to july 27th and then july to october 27th these are the returns we can expect now we're actually going to look at since 
since 1950 because it was about 1953, I believe, when the S&P 500 was actually formed into the index it is now, comprising of the largest 500 public companies in the US listed by market cap. Now we could see here that in the first quarter, 57 wins, 18 losses. In other words, 57 up quarters, 18 down quarters, average return 4.71%, median return 5.96. So the first quarter here, very, very bullish. And if you actually know anything, October 27th is actually when we bottomed last year. And generally, this is a very bullish period. Following on to that quarter two, Jan 27 to April 27, 52 up quarters, 23 down quarters, 2.91% return here, 3.91% median return, another bullish quarter. Quarter three, not quite as bullish as the previous two quarters, 45 up years, 29 down years, 1.49% average return, 0.96 median. And then the fourth quarter, kind of a bearish quarter right here, July to October, 38 up years, 36 down years. That is kind of nuts in comparison to this stat right here. Average return negative 0.34%, median 0.57. So based on this data right here since 1950, May is not a sell. Actually, July to October is a sell. Then we go long in October for what is spectacular returns into the first, second, and third quarter. Very, very interesting data here. I love looking at stats like these just to give us a broad perspective of what could come. Now, guys, we are moving into what is generally a very choppy two quarters into the year. Quarter three, still a little bullish, but quarter four can provide some volatility. So if we do get more volatility on the horizon, don't be surprised. Now on the topic of volatility and volatility coming this week, we do have earnings and a very, very dense week of earnings. By the looks of it, it tends to be a lot of software names. We look at stuff like Uber, Arm, quite a bit of semiconductor names. We've got a, quite a lot of Bitcoin miners, Walt Disney, Rivian, Upstart, Win, Lyft, you know, energy names. It's a, it's a mixed bag, not quite the market cap density like last week or the week prior, but a big week nonetheless. And today we're going to look at Realty Income, Hims and Her Health, as well as Palantir and how they're standing fundamentally. Now, Palantir earnings. So guys, fundamentally, earnings actually came out good. Adjusted EPS beat ever so slightly, and they also beat here on revenue. Now, the stock was down 9% in the after hours, and that was because they actually missed their guidance. The market was expecting $277 billion, and they actually guided a little bit lower for the full financial year 2024, 2.67 to 2.68. They just missed this guidance right here. And you know, you're gonna get this type of performance when you have a stock that's priced to perfection, looking for growth, and they miss their growth metrics. So this is just the market punishing this company. Long term, I am so bullish. I mean, these numbers are fantastic. Fundamentally, the company is sound. It's just what's the growth prospects looking forward if numbers are missing, okay? What's the demand like? And these are the questions, and these are the questions we want answers to uh, looking ahead. Not a good day here for Palantir shareholders, but earnings do tell you that the thesis of this company is still intact, and we'll have to see how the market continues to price in this guidance miss here for Palantir. Looking at Hims and her health, totally different situation. They actually beat significantly on EPS. That's a huge beat. 0.05 versus 0.01 on sales of 278 million. We were expecting 270 million. And this just means the company is finding a lot of operational leverage coupled with the fact that revenue keeps beating to the upside. Absolutely incredible. They actually raised their guidance too. Andrew Dedham, the CEO, came out and said, we announced today we're increasing our outlook for the year and now expect to achieve 1.2 to $1.23 billion in revenue and 120 to 135 million dollars in adjusted EBITDA in 2024, blowing up previous 2025 targets. The market loves to see it. You're gonna get a double beat as well as a raise. You're gonna go up and we actually saw Hims in our health was up significantly here in the after hours. Now on this channel, we always look at the S&P 500 earnings and we rarely ever tackle mid cap, small caps. Well, today I have the data for you guys and have some very, very interesting data. This is the Russell 2000. This right here is actually earnings. This right here is revenue. And we can see that the Russell 2000 is reporting 8.4% earnings growth. So negative earnings growth and then negative 1.2% revenue growth. Now the only positive sectors here for the Russell is healthcare, real estate, utilities, and industrials. Every other sector is negative. Look at comp services on an earnings basis, but on the revenue side, very similar situation. Comp services positive, financial positive revenue, industrials, as well as healthcare. Every other sector reporting revenue here on the decline. So a very, very rough time for earnings this week for the Russell. But we're going to see how this unfolds this week because we have 600 Russell 2000 companies reporting this week. So a very big week here 
for the Russell. And I will keep you updated if I can find the data on these names. But it's not all bad news for the Russell, because if you have a look at earnings growth, if you actually exclude the energy sector, the Russell is reporting positive growth here of 2.6%. 62% of companies are beating analyst expectations. And again, if you exclude energy from the Russell, the revenue growth rate is negative 0.2%. So we have 600 companies reporting this week. I want to see if this revenue figure goes positive, excluding energy. But this is a welcome turnaround regardless to see that excluding this single sector right here, the Russell 2000 is actually on its way to earnings growth. Now on this channel, when it comes to the US economy, we look at three simple measures to determine economic health, GDP, the labor market, and the consumer, and how it all relates to two components, consumption and investment. Now on the GDP front, you can see the Fed GDP now is sitting a little bit above 3%. Everything looks fairly healthy and robust with regards to GDP. What also looks healthy is actually the labor market. Now I do know that we did get a pretty weak jobs report this past week, and that did spur on part of the rally. That's going to help inflation. As you can see, PCE on a three month annualized basis is sitting at 3% here after this March print. So it is fairly elevated and accelerating. However, we did get a weaker jobs report that did help the inflation narrative. That's why stocks rallied. But when you look at it in aggregate, the US economy added 175,000 jobs in the month of April. That is still above the 2019 average. So by all accounts, the job market is still very, very robust. And you also have to understand that through most of the year so far, we've actually added quite a number of jobs and have beaten expectations by a large margin. Last month, we were supposed to get 213K jobs added to the economy. The US economy added 303,000. So while this does represent a slowing, until we see more material downside movements and get anything below the 100,000 mark, and that's when we can start to worry. But as things are right now at this very moment, the labor market is robust, GDP is robust, and the slowing we are seeing in the labor market should help the overall inflation narrative. At the same time, with regards to jobs, we also want to look at other measures, not just non-farm. So we were expecting 250k here in the last non-farms report, but we actually thought it was going to be a lot hotter because the ADP number was 192 that beat expectations. The consensus business pulse beat expectations. The consensus household pulse also beat expectations at 150k. The home base was looking rather strong as well as the GS layoff tracker was rather solid. So all of these measures right here, excluding the non-farm print, was the only one that came in weak. And let's be honest, 175,000 jobs is not actually weak. It's still above the historical trend and the unemployment rate is still sitting at 3.9%, which is well below the historical average for the last 50 years. Now, with regards to the inflation side, inflation has remained sticky and that has to do with one simple thing. It has to do with rent. And that is just the way that the Fed measures rent. They use something called owner's equivalent rent. They also call it OER. Now this right here is OER and you can see that OER hasn't had quite the same disinflation as other similar measures of shelter like this apartment list index as well as the Zillow index. As you can see, there's been quite a lot of disinflation in these shelter measures compared to the OER and in some cases outright deflation. And those lags have to do with lease renewals. And this is just a note here from the Apollo group. And they say almost two thirds of all existing leases for apartments or house rentals get renewed. Nearly all of these renewals were signed one or two years ago. Leases are contracts and they lay out specific terms for renewals within the document. What rates do you think landlords built into their lease renewals 12 to 24 months ago when they were drafting and negotiating those 2022 and 2023 leases? They obviously reflected the inflation rates then, which were peaking. What what do contracts negotiated and executed two years ago have to do with the rate of inflation today? You might assume nothing, but as we see it in the BLS data, which is the OER index, it has an outsized impact. It is very visible in the BLS's new tenant index. The data, unlike OER, does not include renewals. And that's why measures like the Zillow index have experienced far more disinflation than OER. And even if you have a look at the Fed's new tenant index they're proposing, this tenant rent index, it's experienced the same disinflation in the last 12 to 24 months like the Zillow index and this is just a chart compared to actual OER and also when you actually remove CPI from the headline inflation number you actually get CPI at 2.3% right now not the 2.8% now I do know it's weird just to remove shelter but everything excluding shelter in the CPI index is actually very close to the Fed's 2% target and over the next couple of weeks with the labor market cooling off a bit and shelter disinflation 
inflation. This should actually bring CPI, PPI, and PCE down a lot quicker than the market is anticipating. And that's going to bring rate cuts forward. And that's really going to help stocks. And that's also going to help bonds as a whole. Now, guys, let's talk a bit about Gamma. We have Vanna and Charm Flows coming back into the market officially here from the 6th of May. And we will have these dealer supportive flows pretty much for the next two weeks from here, Monday the 6th, all the way up until the options expiration in May on the 17th. So two weeks of dealer supportive flows. And that means as long as we stay in a positive gamma environment, we want to be buyers of dips, sellers of rips all the way up until the 17th. This is really when we can start to see volatility unless we break that gamma flip zone. And this is generally what these Vanna and Charm flows or these dealer supportive flows look like with regards to gamma. You can see that in the first week, they have a kind of an effect the second and third week is where they have the biggest effect. These Vanna and Charm flows, these guys are the strongest. And the reason why we do actually go into this window of weakness is because these type flows actually go on holiday here in the fourth week towards the end of the month. And then they start to return here on the first week. This is where we are right now. And these really only apply when we're in positive gamma. We are in positive gamma right now. So we do want to be buyers of dips, sellers of rips, and we do want to lean long. We do want to lean bullish as we enter into this OPEX week period. Now, this is more of a macro overview. Let's dive into the technicals for this week. So the gamma chart right here provides us of a more minute focus on gamma. We can see the day-to-day -day fluctuations now. Not much has changed from last week. We still have elevated levels right here of negative gamma as well as positive gamma building back up in the tape. You can sort of see why the market has been quite resilient in the last few trading days because we actually have had quite a lot of positive gamma build up in the tape. We can actually see that compared to probably the start of last week, this 5200 strike has really been built out. The same with the 53 300 strike and the 5400 strike compared to almost every other strike here in the negative tape you know there's a couple of big ones but not quite as big as these circling very close to the five billion dollars needed to hedge these strikes versus only one here at the 5000 level which is the biggest one and actually moved up from the 4900 level last week so where does this leave us well the gamma flip zone is 5100 and that means above this level we're buying dips selling rips to 5200 unlikely we're going to see this 5200 strike move up into OPEX. I think we're going to stay at the 5200 up until probably the 17th to 19th year of November. So 5200 is probably the ceiling. We may duck a couple of points above, but that's probably the ceiling into the May OPEX sort of later this month. But I would see 5100 as a very, very strong support zone. And even if we do break below, you can actually see that at the 5000 level is a tiny bit of positive gamma right here that will actually further help the case if we do pull down to this 5000 level in terms of a trade tradable bounce to the upside. So if we do get to 5,000, you do want to be buying dips as support here with just this being a very large strike of negative gamma, a little bit of positive gamma. However, above the 5,100, we want to buy dips, sell rips to this gamma strike. And that's where we are right now. We're in a positive gamma environment. We simply don't want to fight the tape. We have dealer support of flows. So don't look to take serious shorts, at least until we convincingly close below the 5,000 mark. Until then, set out the volatility and be buyers of dips and sellers of rips. Now, looking at seasonality, this this right here is the average performance for May from 1950 to 2023. And this is why the popular term sell in May was formed. That's simply because normally very early year in May, we do form a double top. It's often a lower high double top. And then we actually do begin a sell off period to about the 25th, 26th, 24th of May right here. We form a bottom and we actually see a knee jerk reaction to the upside. Again, remember guys, bottoms tend to be events, tops tend to be a process. And this chart showcases that very clearly. You see what I mean? Tops tend to be a process involved. Bottoms tend to be an event. And essentially what this is telling us is that we should expect further volatility here in May and look for dip buying opportunities, particularly towards the later half of the month. But we could actually bottom right here. We could bottom here. What we really do want to do is just look for opportunities that present itself in May for what could be a knee jerk reaction into the June, July period where we may get rate cuts and get outside size returns 
in the S&P 500. Now let's assume rate cuts are to materialize. What are the returns we can expect? This right here is the S&P 500 returns around the end of a Fed hiking cycle, as well as the US 10 year returns. Now, after the data we got last week with the GDP data, with the NFP data, the market is definitely going to start pricing in earlier and maybe even more rate cuts into 2024, particularly if the data continues to unfold as it is. That is to say we get weaker GDP, weaker employment, as well as inflation coming to the downside. If those three things continue to move lower, do expect rate cuts to be put onto the table. And this is what we can normally expect after the last hike, what normally happens in the S&P 500. And we can see that once the Fed is done hiking, generally speaking, assets, both equities and bonds tend to get very linear returns to the upside. And this is what we've done up until the very 1st of May. This right here is the 1st of May. This right here is the 1st of May. And for the most part, the S&P 500 is moving in line with its historical average. However, we can see that the 10 year has largely underperformed its cohort. And that is why I am a little bit bullish on longer term bonds. I think it's great to add duration on your portfolio because I do think that as rate cuts get put back on the table as they are brought forward, as more cuts might be priced into 2024-25, we're going to see outsized returns here in the 10 year. I also do believe that the 10 year is probably at its highs right now. I think here at the 4.8 range is probably the highs for the year and we should see this number move down and that's going to coincide with outsized returns in long term bonds. Now guys, data in the week ahead, very interesting, not a heavy week of data. We have quite a number of Fed speakers and this is going to be important. They definitely can bring the volatility. We got Williams, Barkins, Kashkari, Cook and Goolsby all speaking this week. And then on the data side, the main ones are going to be like University of Michigan sentiment, initial jobless claims, social in inventories and consumer credit. So nothing big on the data side, quite a lot of Fed speakers. And then on the earnings front, a big week for like hyper growth software names for earnings. But if you've made it up until here, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell. Guys, like this video and leave a comment for the algorithm. Cheers.